In this video, I'm going to talk about the S, P, and D orbitals. We're going to start with the S orbital. The S orbital is a shape or an area of space that an electron occupies when its quantum number L is equal to zero. The S orbital is a spherical shape, so if this is the nucleus of the atom, then the S orbital is a three-dimensional sphere around that nucleus. And again, even though I'm drawing a circle, this is a three-dimensional shape. And this is just the area of space, this sphere is the area of space that the electron is allowed to occupy when it is in this particular orbital. So what I've drawn here, again, is an S orbital. And this particular S orbital is specifically called the 1S orbital. In this notation, the one is used to indicate the principal quantum number, which is n equals one. Remember the principal quantum number indicates the energy level of the electron or the maximum boundary or the maximum size of the orbital. So the one is used to indicate the principal quantum number and then s is used to indicate that l is equal to zero. We also have an s orbital in the n equals two level so let's draw another one over here. In the n equals 2 level, because n equals 2 occupies a larger area of space, the s orbital in the n equals 2 area is just simply bigger. Still three-dimensional, this is supposed to be a sphere, not a circle. This particular orbital we call 2s. The 2, again, is representing that it is in the n equals 2 level, and the s representing that it is l equals 0. And this trend just continues on and on, so we'll just draw one more. This is going to be what we'll call the 3s orbital, so it's even bigger, 3s, which is associated with the n equals 3 energy level, and then the principal quantum number l equals 0. For all of the s orbitals, anytime l equals 0, m sub l for that electron is required to be 0. Always remember that um, m sub l starts at 0 and it goes all the way up to plus or minus l. So for all of these, all the s orbitals, m sub, m sub l equals 0, and that just simply means that there's only one direction for the s orbital. Because the s orbital is a sphere, you really can't point it in one direction or another direction. It's just a perfect sphere. So there's only one direction that the s orbital can occupy. Inside every s orbital, we have m sub s of plus one half and also m sub s minus one half, which means that there is a total of two electrons that can occupy this area of space, one spinning clockwise and one, oh, I did that backwards, one spinning clockwise and one spinning counterclockwise. And that's pretty much everything you need to know about the s orbitals. Now the p orbitals are a different shape than the s orbitals, so if here's the nucleus of an atom, the p orbital is kind of like an infinity symbol or a figure eight shape like this. I'm going to redraw my nucleus right there. So for the p orbital, the electrons are allowed to occupy this area of space or this area of space right here. The p orbital is associated with the principal quantum number L equals 1, not with L equals 0, which means there's no such thing as a 1p orbital. It's actually impossible to have a 1p orbital orbital because you cannot get the principal quantum number L equals 1 when N equals 1. So that might require you to go back and review a little bit um, of how quantum numbers work. The lowest level of a p orbital is a 2p orbital, this guy right here. And again, just like with the s orbitals, the 2 is used to indicate that it's an N equals 2, and the p indicates that it is L equals 1. And n equals 2 just means that the p orbital is restricted to this particular area of space. It's just occupying only a small area in that space. Now remember that these are three-dimensional shapes. They're not like flat. They're definitely not like a racetrack sort of a thing. So what I always try to encourage people is to think about a balloon 
balloon that you would like blow up, tie on a string. The P orbital lobes look a lot like a balloon. So imagine you had a balloon, take the string off of it, get a second balloon, and just kind of hold them tied ends together like this. If you just held them right there, that's what a P orbital would look like. So as you can imagine, um, we could have a 3p orbital and the 3p orbital would just simply be larger than the 2p orbital. So this might be 3p and there's such a thing as a 4p orbital, which would be even bigger. For the p orbitals, m sub l possible values are 0, minus 1, and plus 1. And that simply means that there are three different directions or three ways that the p orbitals can point. And to show you those three directions, I am going to draw some axes like we would use in math for graphing something. And so we're just gonna draw an axis like this. And in chemistry, we're gonna label these, this is the x-axis and this is the z-axis. And so one possible orientation for a p-orbital would be just directly along the x-axis like this. That would be one choice that it could have. And then another possibility would be for that p-orbital to sit along the z-axis like this. And then the third possibility for the p orbital, we're gonna to have to bring in our y axis. So here's our y axis. The third possibility is for that orbital to sit along the y axis, like this. So these are the three different orientations for these p orbitals. Remember there's, there's three different directions that a p orbital can point. If we wanna be really specific about the direction when we're, when we're um, labeling an orbital, we could call this orbital a px, that's a subscript x, because it's lying along the x-axis. And we could call this one a pz, and we could call this one a py. And if we knew what energy level they were in, we would just put it in front. So maybe this is a 2px, and this is a 2pz, and this is a 2py. If we wanted to try to draw a 3px on the same axis, it would probably just look like this. It's just bigger. So in blue there, I drew a 3px. Same area of space, just larger. And so this is what we know about the p orbitals. So let's move on now to the d orbitals. d orbitals are the craziest orbitals that we're gonna study in general chemistry. The d orbitals exist when we have quantum number L equal to two. And when we have quantum number L equal to two, our possible values of m sub L are one, minus one, plus one, minus two and plus two, which means that we have five different directions that these d orbitals can point. Now, I'm gonna attempt to draw all five of them for you, but I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not very great at drawing them. They're not gonna look very good, but I am gonna do my best. Now I have already shown you a little bit about what the d orbitals look like in a previous video. I told you there were two different types of d orbitals. I'm gonna draw the easy one first on this, um, on these axes, it's labeling the same right there. And the D, the easiest one for me to draw is the one that looks like it has like a ring around the middle of it. So it looks like a P orbital like this. And then there is a ring that goes around the whole entire thing, which I'm gonna color that ring in. And so this is a really weird looking orbital like a spare tire hanging around that orbital. This is one of the d orbitals. And this particular d orbital we call a dz squared. That is its name. The other four d orbitals look like, um, kind of like p orbitals, except for they have four lobes on them instead of only having two lobes on them. So the next easiest one for me to draw has, um, going to put the y-axis in here. The next easiest one for me to draw has the lobes, the four lobes, sitting on the x-axis and also sitting on the y-axis. So I'm drawing it like that. Now I want to kind of try to illustrate to you that this is the, the um, d orbital itself is, is relatively flat. It is three-dimensional, so it's not flat like a piece of paper, but it's all, this is all in the same plane. If we were looking down on it, it would look like this. 
And if we were looking at it from the side, it would look kind of something like this. It's all flat, but there, um, the lobes of this orbital are sitting on the x-axis and also on the y-axis. And this orbital's name is d x squared minus y squared, and that's a subscript, subscript x squared minus y squared. So now they just get a, a little bit trickier to draw, and you can see I was already struggling to draw that last one, which means that this is just going to get harder and harder for me. So let's label our axes again. And the next one that we're going to draw has its lobes sitting in between the x and y axes. So it's like this. Here's one lobe, and here's the other lobe. And those two lobes are pretty easy for me to draw. But then we have to draw the third and the fourth lobe that are just, they're sitting in between the x and the y axes. So they're flat. Uh, and like all of these are kind of at a 90 degree angle with respect to each other. This guy's name is DXY, subscript XY. So now we've got we've got two more to go. We can totally do this. While I'm drawing these axes, I'm going to tell you that the d orbitals start at n equals 3. So this might be a 3d z squared, and this might be a 3dx minus y. We can make a note over here while I'm taking a break from drawing. There is no such thing as a 1d orbital, and there's also no such thing as a 2d orbital. And again, um, to understand that, you would want to go back to the videos where we're talking about assigning quantum numbers, where you can see that it's impossible to have an n equals 2 with an l equals 2. There's just no, no such thing. So let's let's tackle our next orbital. The next orbital that we're going to draw has its lobes in between the x and the z axes. So the lobes are going to go like here. The first set is always pretty easy to draw. So it's in between the x and the z axes. And then the next ones I'm going to draw, oh, I didn't mean to draw that a different size, kind of like this. I don't want to imply that it's on the y axis. This is called the d x z because the lobes are sitting in between x and z and now we're ready for the last one and you're probably guessing kind of seeing the trend here and the last one this is going to be called the d y z the lobes sit in between the y and the z axes and as usual the first one is pretty easy to draw and then the second set gets a little harder so those are my 3D orbitals, and if we wanted to just kind of envision what a 4D orbital would look like, it would just be larger. So if this is my 3DXZ, then my 4DXZ would just be something that was bigger, but still in the same general shape on the same axes. So the last thing that we're going to talk about with respect to orbitals is the relative energy of all of our orbitals. Now this is a concept that we're going to come back to. So this is the first time that we're going to get introduced to it, but we will come back to it um, pretty soon in just a few videos. And what I'm drawing here is a kind of like a um, kind of like a graph of energy where we have low energy down at the bottom of this graph and high energy up at the top of the graph. And what we're going to do is put the orbitals in order of increasing energy. The lowest energy orbital is a 1s orbital. And the notation that we use to indicate the orbitals on this type of graph is that we draw a straight line to indicate the orbital and then we write its name right next to it. And we want to have some space here on this line because we're actually going to end up filling stuff in in on these blank lines that we're making so it's it's not uh, we're not writing like a dash 1s we are writing a spot where we're going to put some information in not going to be a heart the next highest energy level is the 2s and then after that is the 2p and remember there are three 2p orbitals so we're going to make three lines, one for each of the 2p orbitals, and then after that is our 3s orbital, and that is followed by the three 3p orbitals. And after that is 4s, and that, now this is going to feel kind of out of order, that is followed by the 3d. And remember we have five d orbitals, so there's five 3ds. That gets followed by the 4ps, and that's followed by the 5s. And the last one that we're going to put on this 
chart is the 4D orbitals, five 4D orbitals. This is obviously not all of the orbitals, but this is enough orbitals to get you through pretty much any single general chemistry situation that you might encounter. Now this does look like it's totally random. It starts out having some sort of order and then things go south in terms of the order. What I want you to do is resist the urge to memorize the order of the orbitals because in a few videos, I'm gonna show you a really great trick on how to remember this or just figure it out by looking at the periodic table. So we can actually get all this information off of the periodic table just by looking at it, no need to memorize. So I'm gonna put a note on here that you don't need to memorize this, just keep it handy for now, refer to it if you need to refer to it, right now and pretty soon I'm going to show you a trick that will help you recall this information without having to memorize.